Okay, if everyone is ready, I will call this meeting of the Community Justice Reform Committee. It is December 12th, 1922. And the first... It's 2022. Oh, well, I like to kind of make up dates. It's, I do that a whole lot. <laughs> and Courtney, if you would please call the roll. Here. 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 I believe uh, Council Member Wiltz will be joining us virtually today. Is that it? And yeah, April Wilson is here, and Karen Remdeck. Here, and Prosecutor Oliphant is also here. Oh, there we go. Karen Remdeck. <laughs> All right. Um, April, were you ever, ever able to write up that final um, statement for guiding principles? Uh, yes, Commissioner Jones. I actually sent. on Zoom. Pardon? There we go. Build a justice facility that meets constitutional standards and treats inmates with dignity. Address inequities in race, economic status, disability, national origin, sexual orientation, and gender and reduce the number of people entering the criminal justice system and reduce recidivism for those who are or were in the system. Does anyone have any problems with adding these to our, state, our uh, statement of principles? I just want, is, the, is this on, can you hear me? I just wanted to thank uh, Ms. Wilson and our prosecutor, Eric Oliphant, for working on this. Really appreciate the updates and your attention to detail and noticing that we were missing some key phrases uh, such as collaboration, transparency, which obviously I think uh, commit uh, council member Crossley when we were originally designing these, that was just the conversations that were ongoing. So thank you for doing this. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And I believe these are now already not seeing any objection. I'm not really sure if we're supposed. Uh, okay, I wasn't sure if we're supposed to take votes or not. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Okay, our next order of business is. Um, treatment, the sequential intercept model, intercept zero presenter will not be here today, but will be here in January. Um, and 
Our next update is the survey updates. And I believe Ms. Wilson has a lot of information for us. Thank you, Commissioner Jones. Um, I'm going to share my screen. And uh, Deputy Public Defender Karen Rembeck and I will be presenting jointly. All right, can everyone see the screen? Mm -hmm. All right, well, first of all, thank you to the commissioners for requesting the survey and for the opportunity to be able to present our results. Um, uh, we appreciate it. And please feel free to ask questions at any point during the survey, we're happy to clarify. So before we jump into our results, I just wanted to briefly cover some of the survey parameters that we were working with. First of all, we were charged with surveying both the Monroe County Prosecutor's Office, the Monroe County Public Defender's Office, and the Monroe County Bar Association. Now, recognizing that the Bar Association does include some of the Prosecutor's Office and the Public Defender's Office, I can't give you a clear number of how many people could have possibly responded, but later on, we'll be able to tell you how many did. So, um, in terms of guidelines, I, I hope the survey is looking towards experience-focused questions. Um, did you have this experience? Tell us about it. Um, you'll see that, in fact, uh, in fact, along the survey, there's some experience questions where if you didn't have that experience, we skipped you to another section. Um, so we're very experienced focused. We also had limited mandatory questions and inclusion of no opinion or don't know selection, which allowed people to engage with questions um, kind of on their own terms, which I think is an important part of this process. We also... Um, made sure the survey was anonymous. We did not collect anyone's email. And in keeping true to that, none of the data we'll be presenting tonight will be what the prosecutor's office thought versus the public defenders. It's tell us about your experience. Let's share that with the committee. Um, transparency is another thing that's really important and I'm glad we're, we've been talking about that. Um, in keeping true to transparency, all of the comments that we received and some of those open-ended questions are all included in our slide presentation. Um, you may notice that the uh, slide presentation is pretty lengthy. We won't be able to read all of those comments tonight, but we have included them in plan and you've all received them. And the slide presentation that would be PDF'd and I hopefully provided to the community will also include all of those comments. They were copy and pasted and moved over. I didn't correct anything. The only change I made was one surveyor did include their name and phone number. Mm -hmm. And I've provided that to the committee and then I marked it where it's been redacted on this PowerPoint presentation. To try to get that comprehensive approach like the commissioners were looking for, these are the four areas we approached um, and surveyed about. We are gonna do it a little different order tonight um, and we will be covering the comments under the co-location section, which I know is one of the topics that we're discussing um, presently. And then some of the comments that are in the jail and justice campus design, which as we move into next year, where there's some discussion about design in those areas, we can, we're happy to have another session to kind of talk about those comments and answer any questions about them as well. All right, so our survey results, so starting with what our response was. We had 67 responses as of Saturday evening. Uh, I will share that I did not close the survey and we did receive an additional one today. So that one is not included, um, but it did close Saturday night. I will be sure to share those comments with the committee. I think that's important to have their comments included. Um, so I'll share that at a later time. What I'm uh, very thankful about, as you can see, we had responses from the public defender's office, the prosecutor's office. We also had um, someone from not, uh, some nonprofit organization response, a nice uh, representative, I think of kind of cross-section of people are in, encountering the system. We also had responses from not just attorneys, but also paralegals, investigators, victim assistants, and secretaries are an administrative role, which I think is important as we're trying to hear everyone's different experiences and have a comprehensive response. In this slide, I'd like you to know at the top left-hand corner, you'll see frequently on our slides, it'll say the number of responses. Going back to our, um, not, not everyone had to answer if they didn't want to. There weren't a lot of mandatory questions. You'll see a variance there. You'll also see a variance if 
um, it was uh, an experience-based question. And Ms. Renbeck will kind of share some of that as she approaches it. And I'll tell, turn it over to Ms. Renbeck for... Okay. Okay, so for a co-location, we started by asking about current transportation to the current Justice Building. And just to clarify, throughout the survey, we called it the Charlotte T. Zitlow Justice Building when we were talking about sort of current. And I think we called it sort of like the, a new justice campus or something when we were talking about potential new building. So as you can see, um, we kind of asked just how, how do you get how do you get to work basically and vast majority of car, perhaps unsurprising. Um, but we did have a good amount of walkers and carpoolers and bicycles. Um, and then we also asked, um, in my personal experience, other people who come to the Justice Building, so not the respondent, but someone else, so people who are clients, litigants, witnesses, anybody else, um, how do they come? We did also allow everyone to answer select all for both of these questions. So the numbers don't quite match because uh, some people could have clicked multiple. So um, a lot of car, a lot of walk, a lot of bus, I mean, pretty much everything. And then this question did have a fill in the blank section. So the service providers, one person typed that in as their uh, option. We didn't think of that, but we appreciated that as well. Um, the next section we talked where we asked about was uh, sort of participation in courtrooms. And so the first question we asked um, was how often do you actually have to come to court basically in a courtroom during the workday? Um, as you can see in the note, if you answered the answer to this is never or no, um, then basically you were not asked some of the future questions because those are more specifically asking how often you're in court and those kinds of things. So, um, I mean, notable about this one is for, if you look at the sort of never and rarely sections, the red and blue sections, um, pretty small. Um, so, but as you may remember from the previous, um, pie chart. Um, there was a lot of non-attorneys who answered. So we just want to explain that, you know, there is a lot of situations where non-attorneys also have to come to court for various reasons, uh, administrative staff, investigators, um, secretaries, every, everyone really, uh, more people need to come to court than just attorneys. Um, and then we, or do you want to talk about this? Okay. So then we, uh, if you answered you had to come to court sometimes. Um, we asked them about asking um, how often they would be able to be transported or travel between the current justice building and the proposed location on Fullerton Pike. Um, and sort of always, sometimes, never, and no opinion. Um, we think, uh, I mean, pretty clearly, a lot of people said always, but there was a, a decent portion of people who did not say always. Uh, so 60, basically two thirds said always and about a third said frequently or less. Um, so it's just something we are kind of not sure about and considering sort of this new location. Sure. Is it okay to ask questions in the middle? Yeah. So 11% had no opinion. Mm -hmm. Does that mean they don't know how to get there or they don't know it, that it's going to happen? So they didn't want to answer the question or how do you interpret that? Mm, that's a good question. I think, um, well, to get to that question, they had to answer the previous question that they do have to appear in court at least some of the time. Um, so the no opinion, I don't know if that's a matter of like, they're not sure um, if they would have reliable transportation. What do you think? Uh, it, the question is how often would you have access? So um, one of the things we want to be careful about is trying to guess at what anyone was thinking, but I would say, um, What's interesting about this particular slide, other than that 11%, is that if you compare this slide to the previous, 66.7% said they would always have access to reliable transportation. But if you go, if you go backwards, sorry, other way, if you go back, um, we're only looking at 6% of our respondents who never have to attend court hearings. And that was something we really wanted to bring to your attention uh, especially when we're talking about whoever it is may need to travel back and forth during the middle of the day, that slide compared to this one, I think is really important when we're talking about access to the courtrooms for employees in particular in this slide. A quick thing that we haven't mentioned so far in our PowerPoint is that at the beginning of the co-location section, we did um, post a brief explanation of what the Fullerton Pike location, what that means. And we posted um, a photo of um, the site that was from the, the city planning commission report, the report that was submitted to the planning commission. So basically at this stage, we explained what co-location means, where the Fullerton Pike location is, that it's at the corner of Fullerton Pike and um, I-69. So we didn't put that in the PowerPoint, but that was, there was some background information just because we weren't for sure that everyone would know what we meant when we were talking about something like co-location. 
So. And then we just asked a couple um, brief questions about how often they were people were in more than one courtroom during the day. Um, so again, this one's, uh, I, I don't know, it's a little surprising to me, I guess. Um, the never portion was pretty small, 12.7%. 12 12 Almost everyone um, needed to be in more than one courtroom at least some, some part of the day. Um, and then the next question actually was, uh, how often are you in more than two courtrooms during the day? And that, that's where we stopped. We didn't go any further than two. But um, again, you know, that was maybe a little less common if you just compare this slide to the previous slide. And I think that slide is particularly informative as I think the current plan is to have one or two satellite locations. So I think this gives us some good data and trying to understand the impact um, if there are only one or two court satellites at the new jail. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then we did ask if any, if the respondents had ever attended a hearing in both civil court and criminal court in the same day, as you can see, um, the majority said no, but there was a pretty significant portion who did say yes. And the reason we asked this question is just because we had been talking about previously about whether the civil courts and or the criminal courts should be co-located with the jail or not. And there was some discussion about should one stay here and one go down, you know, downtown, one to Fullerton Pike. So we thought this was important information to know. Um, oh. So uh, in this section at the very end of co-location, we did, and I'll read this, the Monroe County Commissioner's current plan is to initially build a jail and possibly one to two satellite courtrooms at Fullerton Pike with all other courts and offices. It's up there. Thank you. <laughs> courts or offices to remain at their current locations downtown for at least five to 10 years. Considering this current plan, please share any additional recommendations regarding courtroom access or transportation. So on this question, it was an open-ended question. We did receive 30 responses, which I think is pretty, I think it was the most of any other open-ended question. Recognizing time limitations, we're not reading other uh, responses. However, because we had such a a significant response here, as well as it's what I think we're currently discussing, we are gonna take time to read those comments and Ms. Rembeck and I will alternate between them. And if you have any questions, if you could just save those for the end and we'll come back to them. All right, so build it all at the same time as it will save the county money in the long run. The entire complex can be built specifically the way it needs to be instead of a justice center that has to be built a certain way with features that everyone will have to deal with because the existing building would allow an addition done a certain way. The location is untenable. There is no infrastructure to support the jail facility and no safe way to travel there. The population subject to the criminal system relies on supportive services only available in Bloomington downtown proper. New Leaf, New Life, Beacon, Wheeler Mission, Community Kitchen, all of these places are accessible on foot from current court and the current jail. I do not believe it is ethically possible to relocate the jail to Fullerton Pike without major development of the proposed area and relocation of supportive services. People are released from jail without shoes in winter. Doing it on the side of a highway with the closest public utility being a McDonald's two miles away is a terrible, terrible idea. Courts need to be where people in jail are. I'm not going to allow my caged clients to be represented only as throwaway faces on screen, video screens for the convenience of a courtroom five miles away. This is the worst possible location site. As a public defender, majority of the people I represent rely heavily on public transportation or walk. The centralized downtown location is perfect for the large indigent population I represent. It is also close to essential areas my clients frequent, such as New Leaf, New Life, Beacon, Inc., and AA meetings. Good plan, as it is described in this question. Do not move all courtrooms out there just yet. Step by step, Justice Center needs to be downtown for now. I believe the jail, courts, and offices should remain closer to downtown area. I would not split the locations all on the same campus. I believe the prosecutor's office, public defender's office, and criminal courts should all move with the jail sheriff's department due to the constant contact the offices share with the facility. It is also very helpful and beneficial that we have most of these places in one building and within walking distance of each other. I am worried about access to other community resources for defendants and victims of crime and their families. I am worried about the people we serve having to find transportation all over town instead of most resources being centered near downtown. 
leaving all court offices, especially the public defender's office, probation office, and community corrections downtown will greatly hinder those who are in need or are ordered to report to them after release. This will also cause great frustration and hardship on community corrections and probation officers because currently if an individual is released from MCJ, most who are able to walk have the ability to walk to the buildings to report immediately. Without these offices being close to the new jail, it gives offenders slash individuals the opportunity to not report or can cause additional barriers for them to do so, which can result in more charges or violations being filed against them and pose a risk for community safety. One to two satellite courtrooms will not be enough. The jail is still going to have to incur transportation costs to and from the Justice Center for hearings. Jail is also going to have to be adequately staffed to transport those in custody to and from hearings, which is unlikely given current hiring needs. This would also be building a jail near a densely populated area of family homes, which seems like a poorly thought out idea. It would be more convenient if the jail and all courts and offices were on the same campus. It would be difficult to bring inmates from the proposed location to the Justice Building downtown. I see this being a lot of work and think you need to change your plan. It just doesn't seem feasible. I worry having the two systems apart for five to 10 years would be detrimental to our clients. If the plan is to move to Fullerton Pike, then we need to all be moved to Fullerton Pike. But I do not see a way this will work for our severely indigent clients unless we have a daily routine service where they can request free transportation, i.e. rural transit or 411. Splitting up courtrooms seems disastrous for public defenders who are in multiple courtrooms a day and have a jam-packed schedule. That is the absolute worst idea I've ever heard. There is no possible way for me to do my job properly if some courts in jail are a 20 minute drive away. This will slow down court proceedings and judicial process even more. The judges will be furious, clients will be furious, attorneys will be furious every day. Would there be any concern for individuals riding bikes slash birds on 37 to get to the facility? I have seen this sort of setup work reasonably well in other cities. I think it is a mistake to separate the jail from the courts. The jail should be accessible to all courtrooms and centrally located in town. I do not believe a new Monroe County Jail should be constructed. Our county cannot constitutionally, ethically, and humanely operate the jail we are currently using. Building a bigger facility further from the city will not remedy any of the problems my clients face due to their incarceration. Bad idea. There is plenty of space downtown. It would be ideal to keep all in one place. Staff don't have to travel between locations and it is simple for public to know where to go. But if not enough space, including parking, or if city badly needs space for other purposes, Fullerton Pike seems a decent idea. I think this location is too far slash remote from four defendants. It is also believed that this is going to transfer a criminal element to this area of town and this area will suffer as a result. Splitting everything up instead of having one campus is going to cause a lot of problems that are not being given enough weight. One, the criminal justice system is more than just the jail and courtrooms. When a defendant is released on pretrial release or after pleading guilty, the person will need to go to the probation department for services. Similarly, when released from jail after being appointed counsel, the person is instructed to go to the public defender's office and make an appointment right away. We are often dealing with folks that have transportation issues or other barriers, cognitive issues, addiction issues, et cetera, that already make it difficult to get them to go from point A to point B without coming across stumbling blocks. This plan essentially spreads out these resources by putting miles in between locations and asking the person to make it happen. Two, the prosecutors and public defenders have a lot of court hearings, and when not in court, they are often getting pulled several different directions trying to get the rest of their work done. Some examples include having to meet with victims who show up planned and impromptu prosecutor, preparing for hearings slash doing legal research, both offices, meeting with clients, public defenders, having police officers who show up to the office and need a search warrant, which requires office preparation, but also going to court to find a judge, prosecutor, et cetera. It is very inefficient for offices to not be near the actual court system. Members of the committee have cited the criminal justice study to say we aren't moving cases fast enough. We all have very high caseloads and are constantly working to stay afloat. It is literally a grind and this proposal is adding to it. Adding extra barriers like a commute between locations will only bog down the system more. For example, if I have 45 minutes between hearings, right now I would go downstairs and work in my office where all my files, coworkers and office resources are. But if you add a commute between the courtrooms and the office, it will make it doesn't make sense to travel back to the office where you can be the most efficient and have resources at your disposal. Three, 
If someone violates pretrial release, probation, day reporting, a problem solving court, et cetera, by being intoxicated, it creates a safety risk in having the courtrooms and jails so far away from those offices. For example, if we have someone who is a habitual drunk driver on pretrial release who tests positive for alcohol on day reporting or shows up to a probation appointment drunk, that is a violation that needs to be addressed immediately because this person has a history of choosing to drive after drinking, being a danger on the roadways, and is still drinking. Instead of walking the person up to a judge, as we do now, the staff will have to figure out a way to transport the person. You can't have a person who is intoxicated drive themselves, but also it is a safety risk to have staff drive someone who might be going to jail for the violation. There are a lot of considerations like these that I'm not sure all the members of the committee are aware of. Four, if the committee is still flexible on location, I wanna point out that so many of our social services are at or near downtown, Shalom Center, Middleway House, Amethyst House, Centerstone, The Rec, Indiana Recovery Alliance, et cetera. There is nothing near the proposed location in terms of social services. Five, I doubt this will get much consideration. There is also quality of life component for employees too. Working in the criminal justice system is stressful and burnout is common. It is hard to fill these positions. Adding additional day-to-day -day stressors makes the job less appealing for recruitment and retention of employees. Wasting time with the commute back and forth from the jail slash courtrooms to the office, there being no lunch options at the proposed location, et cetera. Six, the jail may have to transport inmates to the offsite courtrooms. That is going to put further strain on an already understaffed jail, not to mention the additional expense in transporting inmates. Seven, so many people who interact with our criminal justice system, defendants, victims, families, witnesses have major transportation issues. While I certainly respect the idea of putting a new bus line out there, it is a lot more time consuming, especially when someone is already taking time out of their day to attend court for them to try and catch a bus out to a remote area. It's not like catching a bus downtown, which is a hub that all the other bus lines connect with. Additionally, I don't know what individuals who need to use the bus after hours are supposed to do, i.e. someone who bonds out of jail. I understand there are financial limitations in building the campus all at once. Would it be possible to leverage the current jail location by putting it up for sale to, for future development to shore up more funding to build a single campus? Splitting things up is a really bad idea, and I hope the committee thinks outside the box to not make that happen. I am strongly opposed to the location of the proposed new jail facility, although I personally have reliable transportation that would enable me to get to and from my office and the jail. I know many members of the public, including criminal defendants, will not have a consistent, reliable method of getting to or from the jail, especially since it is so far from the downtown area of Bloomington, which is where all of the current courts are located. Additionally, the current location of the jail provides much better access to services and reliable transportation, including public transportation, as both are much more abundant in the downtown area of Bloomington. I am not sure how you can split up courtrooms without a significant impact on litigants and the public defender's office. The public defender's office works in multiple courtrooms, including civil and criminal. This plan would require them to drive back and forth during the day while trying to balance meeting with their clients in and out of custody. Also, we frequently have defendants in the wrong courtroom now, and we only have one location. Now we can walk them down the hall. I'm not sure how two different locations would work, especially for litigants who may not have a car. I am really concerned about inmates who are released at night, especially in the winter. Will there be a year-round bus line? Some unhoused defendants can currently walk to Shalom Center for breakfast, make it to day reporting, and attend their hearings all by walking. I worry about how this plan will affect their ability to accomplish all of this. Additionally, some individuals would prefer to walk and not take a bus. For some, the bus might be triggering. If the only plan for transportation is a bus because of the distance from downtown, how will this affect those with mental health issues? One last note. Sometimes defendant, defendant turn themselves into the jail when they have a warrant. How will they accomplish this if the Fullerton Pike is so far away? We should never move the main courtrooms out of the downtown area. This is a cluster in the making. We wait sometimes one plus hours for inmates to travel from the jail to the rooms and that's within the same building. The logistical complications of moving inmates from across town are significant. I can see parking issues for staff who have offices in one place and frequently go to a courtroom in the other. I often go to, to court for just one hearing or half an hour half an hour, so having to travel to another building for just that half hour would take a significant longer time than it does now while we work in the same building. This would be a logistical nightmare in more ways than I can include in this survey. It will not be possible to have hearings by video starting in January 2023 unless all parties agree or good cause is found. I expect most slash all defense attorneys will not agree to their clients appearing from the jail via video, which will require in-person hearings. 
there will need to be a significant number of jail staff with the sole purpose is, is transporting inmates to and from court each day. It is not always known if an defendant will be jail or not when their next hearing is set. Even if the courts tried to set an in-jail day in the satellite courtrooms, some of those defendants won't be in jail anymore and other defendants who weren't in jail previously will be. Satellite courtrooms must be accessible to the public, so those courtrooms will require bailiffs for the general public who wish to attend. At a bare minimum, there will also need to be space for court reporters, public defenders, private attorneys, prosecutors, and probation. When defendants are released now, they're often instructed to immediately go to probation to make an appointment with their probation officer, et cetera, community corrections to be put on home detention, et cetera, or pretrial release. If the jail is five miles from downtown and no other offices move, it will be next to impossible for a defendant to make it downtown in time to follow these instructions. The courts often need defendants brought down on short notice, which will be impossible if the jail is located five miles away from the courts. It would be very impractical to have two courts operating in a separate location from the others. Given the number of hearings that occur in each court and the number of times that attorneys are expected to be in multiple courts within a short time frame. When I handled a caseload in all four courts, I once had three contested hearings all scheduled at the exact same time in three different courts. That's obviously impossible, but I made it work by running directly from one hearing to the next which I could do because the courtrooms are just down the hall from one another. It would, it would likely be easier to have a holding area at the Justice Building for the day's in-custody litigants than to try to move only some courts for the day. Generally, there are a lot of efficiencies to by had by co-locating the entire campus, but there are many places who make it work. I'm sure that you visited some jails and other communities that are making it work. Before we move on, um, does anyone have any questions about process currently in the justice system that was addressed in any of those comments? No questions, but it's clear people took this very seriously, and I really appreciate the time people to write in. I mean, people really seriously thought about this. It's really helpful. Can we start? Sorry, we're still in the co-location section, but we just wanted to cover recommendations. Um, and, and I agree, Council Member Iverson, I'm really appreciative of how many people took time to fill out these comments. And I would encourage everyone on the committee to read the remaining comments that we may not get to tonight due to time constraints. So in this one, we asked, should the following offices be co-located with the new Monroe County Jail? So if you look at the blue is yes, uh, red for no, uh, orange, no opinion. Uh, you can see at least um, for the top, the criminal courts was a pretty solid yes. Uh, sober court services, civil courts came in third, I think in terms of strong yeses and then clerk's office. Voter registration uh, was predominantly a no. If you look to the very bottom left-handed left-hand slide, it's sheriff. Um, you can see predominantly yes. Same thing for building security, bailiffs, and ASI. And if I could just take a minute to explain the difference for anyone who has a question about this. So there are bailiffs who are inside the courtroom. Um, and then additionally, ASI is a security that is at the front of the building. So when you go through the security in the justice building, those are usually ASI employees, but you also have bailiffs there. So they're actually two different uh, individuals. Um, tech technical support department, so TSD, we might use for short. It was a yes, but it was not as strong as the sheriff and building services. Um, Stride Center um, was predominantly no opinion, and it looks like the yes and no were pretty close. And lastly, parking lots was a strong yes. And in the very middle slide to our right, um, strong yes for prosecutor's office, public defender's office, probation, pretrial release, and community corrections. Does anybody have any questions about any of these departments or what they do while we're on this slide? Yes, sir. Please go first. I just wanted to remind the committee that um, while I almost always speak just for myself and not for the Board of Judges, that I can say that the Board of Judges has expressed that they have zero wish to be split. Just to keep that in mind for everybody. Thank you. And when you mean split uh, in terms of criminal and civil courts, you all went at the same location. Is that Correct. right? Okay. We have one court services office currently that serves all of the courts. It would be almost um, a, a ridiculous idea to try to budget for that in both locations or et cetera. In addition, we're a unified board of judges. So we need to be able to cover each other's cases. And would you mind explaining, if you don't mind, 
Uh, would you mind explaining what it means to be a unified court? Certainly. Um, as far as I understand it, there are really only two unified courts in the state um, here in Monroe County and in Delaware County. And functionally, what that means is that any of us as a judge can sub for any other judge at any time, and it has the same level of authority. It also means that we present only one budget to the county for funding, which is a great efficiency. And in fact, my understanding of the history of this is that when the courts first unified, that the county council and commissioners were thrilled because it was far less work for them uh, than it is in many other areas. For example, we only have one probation staff, not a probation staff for each judge. We only have one set of bailiffs. We don't have bailiffs who work for each judge individually. So it's a, it's a great efficiency to have a unified court system. Thank you. Council Member Iverson. Uh, yes, I was uh, curious about the definition of co-location for this slide. Uh, and does, so for example, when you said technical services, is there a distinction that respondents would have made between having a technical service office, but the main hub for technical services in a different location and co-location being like an office in the new jail and everyone else is in a different location? Or does that mean that the entire office would move out to the justice facility? That's such a great question. And I think we didn't, we used one definition for co-location throughout, um, trying to think of what slide we included that on. It was basically um, things that are located at the same or nearby places. Yeah. And, so that, we, and we did not specify with TSD, whole department, just a small right, right, individual right. or office or. It's a good question. It's just though. something we had thought might, people might have an opinion on. <laughs> I'll just say that in many other areas, courts have their own TSD department rather than working with the county TSD department, which may be something that other people were thinking of. I have no idea what they were thinking of, but I know that's fairly common across the state. And again, that's an efficiency of our current location is we can use the same TSD folks as the rest of the county, which is, I think, good. And I'm glad you asked that question because we didn't suss it out. And you're right, there is a difference. I would, a really important difference in terms of um, space as well, if you're trying to do them at different times. I, I would say in my, in our experience, we have seen a TSD come to the courtroom when, for example, the record is not able to run or we're having issues being able to connect to video when we need to have a hearing. So uh, that is, that's another way in which TSD is interacting, not just helping with making sure our computers run so we can access our email, but it's a really key part that's happening in the courtroom quite often. But thank you. Well, and no recording means no court. <laughs> so we have to have the recording system working or else we're all stuck. Yeah. That's the essential bit. Does anyone else have any questions? Okay. So we're not gonna read, um, this was sort of just asking gen generally, is there anything we didn't list that you think should be included or considered in terms of co-location? And people did um, give several different answers um, throughout this. So they are all located you know, in the PDF we've sent. Um, so we're not gonna necessarily read all of these, um, but we were, uh, we, there were definitely things people thought of that we had not thought of. Um, so we respectfully would request the committee read all the comments when they get a chance, hopefully before our next meeting, and we'd be happy to kind of revisit them. But there are several slides of these. Um, okay, now switching over um, back from co-location, this is actually the first part of the survey people answered, which is about uh, the current jail and also some questions about sort of a future facility. So the first section we asked them about was meeting rooms. Um, and the very first question was pretty straightforward. Have you ever met with an inmate in the jail in person? If they answered no, then they sort of skipped the next set of questions because there was some more specific questions about that experience. And it was fairly 50-50, which I was actually pleased to note. Um, and then we asked just generally how easy it was to schedule an in-person appointment with an inmate currently, um, a pretty fair mix, I would say, um, some difficult, some easy, you know, no clear, really no clear, um, answer. And then we, someone did type in, or I think this was a choice actually we made is I did not schedule the appointment. So if they didn't know that was sort of the, I don't know answer here. And I just want to add the reason that this question is worded this way is not just the public defender is meeting with an inmate in the jail, right? There may be someone from the prosecutor's office who may need to meet with an inmate, whether they be a victim, that defendant be pro se. So that's why going back to our kind of guidelines as we're looking through this, this is an experience question. So you're going to get a lot of uh, perspectives from it. 
private attorneys too, um, and investigators as well. Uh, you know, at least speaking from our office, they meet with inmates pretty regularly. And pre-trial release, yeah, they they're actually going to be on your survey. We didn't we didn't send our survey to probation. That's one thing we should clarify. So our survey did not go to probation or the courts. The court has a survey for them, which will be at a future meeting. I'm yeah, sure. I'm hoping we can, <laughs> by the way, be on the January agenda. Is we have more than thirty responses from judges, court reporters, and bailiffs, and I think we're up to close to forty responses from probation. Mm -hmm. Great. That's exciting. Yes. So um, then we sort of just ask some general, like, why might you be delayed meeting with someone um, currently? And, um, you know, mixed results, uh, some, you know, frequently since sometimes, um, but generally all of these are issues that, uh, speaking from experience, we have run into. Um, so we're just kind of curious who else might have dealt with them. And then... Uh, an oddly specific question, probably the most specific question we have in the entire survey. Um, currently, if you meet with an inmate in the jail, there is a light switch in the room that you turn on and a light goes on in the hallway uh, and that indicates to jail staff that you are done and they can come get you out of the meeting room and um, let you out. So we asked what's the longest period of time you've waited for jail staff to come to your meeting room after turning on the light. Um, it's been a while. <laughs> um, which this this entire section of the survey obviously is more about the current jail. Um, but the reason we included this and thought it was important is because as other people have mentioned in public comment, um, regardless, even if the current plan we have happens and we're able to build a jail by 2025, we will still have our current jail until 2025. So there are things we need to consider and look at and work on now that are current problems um, that we don't want to forget about and lose sight of, even though we're still pursuing sort of multiple things at the same time. And just before we move on from the slide, to add a little more, the, the room, there is only one door to enter the room in the jail for this meeting room. So typically the defendant goes to the other side or inmate goes to the other side and then there's a glass divider or there's a divider in between and then a glass plexiglass to speak through. Um, the light that you flip is only on the attorney side and then um, the door is shut. So just to know it's only on one side of the divider, just something to keep in mind in terms of design and safety as we move forward, like Ms. Rembeck said. We wanted to know just for those who had met with people in the jail, what were they thinking about for our new Monroe County Jail in terms of numbers of meeting rooms? Um, Sam Crow isn't here, right? So right now, does anyone know how many, I'm not, if you've been up there, you don't get to answer, but how many meeting rooms does our current jail have? I know you know, because you've been up there. <laughs> Currently we have two, two meeting rooms in person. Um, They're shared by the public defender, probation, private attorneys, potentially the prosecutor, if they need to meet with people. Um, really anyone who has to go up there. Um, at treatment, when treatment has to go up there, they use those center stone. Um, so right now we've got two. Um, and if you take a look at the chart, uh, no one answered one to two. That was zero responses. Uh, the majority was five to six meeting rooms was kind of the recommendation. We did have a blank in this uh, question as well. So the answers that are typed in, those sort of sentence answers um, were what people typed in. So there was some, I'm not sure, not qualified, and I don't believe a jail should be constructed. Karen, I don't know if you want to mention too, those are used oh. for holding cells. So. Oh, yes. Um, oftentimes we go to meet with folks and the jail is using those meeting rooms to, to hold inmates uh, kind of on a temporary basis. So there are times where we'll try to go meet with someone and both of the meeting rooms are full and we cannot uh, meet with our client because they're using them to hold people um, until they're you know assigned to a block or whatever the issue is. So. And then we asked, you know, just sort of generally what size should in-person meeting rooms be in terms of compared to the current um, location. And generally the unsurprising response was larger, some the same size, no, no one responded smaller. And then again, we're not going to read all of these necessarily, but there were a lot of comments, 18 comments actually about in-person meeting rooms specifically. And some of them reference sort of the current jail, some more reference like future, you know, future buildings and what those should have. Um, but there were a lot of them and they're pretty detailed. Uh, 
And then flipping over, we asked about video meeting rooms. Um, very similar questions, just kind of flipping over to differentiate from video meeting rooms versus um, in person. We asked, this was one of the first questions, just would this help you? Would it help you to talk to somebody via video in your job? Um, and we got, you know, mostly the majority was no, but there was a pretty significant portion who said yes. And then this was the trigger question as to, did you answer the future set of questions? Have you ever done this? Have you ever met with someone via video? Um, not including court hearings because um, some people have done that uh, via Zoom because of COVID and things. Um, same question about how easy or difficult was it for you to do to schedule the actual uh, video meeting? Um, pretty wide range on this one too, in terms of difficulty level. And then how often have you been delayed speaking to someone because of different issues? Um, the most common, uh, well, the most frequent was actually jail technology, um, followed, I'd say pretty closely by like jail staff limitations, limited appointment times, meeting rooms being in use. Um, and then the final one, which is kind of variety was my office's video issues. And then the same question, how many video meeting rooms would you recommend? And actually um, the majority here answered three to four um, and five to six, pretty similar numbers. Um, currently we have one, one video meeting room um, in the jail. It is used by everyone. Again, it's used by probation. It's um, used by the public defender's office. Some private attorneys use it when they're appointed as public defenders. Um, it is frequently booked. And then there's uh, similar comments, less comments about video meetings than there were about in-person because I think video meetings are a little more rare just based on the availability, but please read all these comments. They're helpful and pretty specific. Oh, sorry, I went too far. Um, so in the next section, we were talking about jail capacity. So um, as you'll know, in the Ray report, it talks about how many beds are currently in the jail and splits out K block, which is for select inmates with mental health issues. And then it um, then talks about the total capacity. In the Ray report, it just talks about total capacity, but we wanted to, to split this up into two different questions to kind of get at them both. So an, we did include um, above this uh, a link to the Ray report. We did include the number of beds currently with citations and explain what K block, how many beds there, there are currently seven in K block, and, and then ask them these two questions. A new Monroe County Jail should have um, blank beds for select inmates with mental health issues. Um, just keeping in mind that K block is currently seven in our jail, um, you can see that the light blue is more than 30. That was 25.4%, and that tied for um, 20 to 30, um, which is the purple. So that's a little, that's a little over 50%. Mm. That question also had 67 responses, which is every person everyone that the answered this, which we were again, and this none of these questions at this stage are mandatory. So everyone did actually answer this one, which is nice. And then we're getting at, in addition to the mental health beds discussed above, so trying to be really clear that we're talking about different beds, a new Monroe County Jail should have um, blank beds. Uh, you'll notice that this graph is a little bit different than the other ones, and that was trying to capture all the different comments. And that's because some people filled in the other category and included specific numbers. And we just really wanted to make sure we covered all the comments that were made in this section. Uh, it, I also, when I did the, the pie chart, uh, because there's so many answers, I tried to label them by the range that was available or the number to get a better sense of um, the percentage. Um, as you can see, we had answers um, in a lot of different categories. We had a lot of people who wrote in uh, specific numbers. You can see those because they're single numbers like 800, 500 plus, 600. Those were all specific write-ins because we gave ranges to select from and then left an other. And then we had that no opinion where once again, that was kind of important for us to include in case someone didn't want to, didn't want to answer that question or just didn't know. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have any questions about this particular slide? I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. The comment at the very bottom where it, I can't see there. So I'm trying to turn around and use this at the same time. And I'm <laughs> that light green. 
the we should have at least 500 so we can stop letting everybody out. That's a person that is in our like criminal justice system agency currently. That is someone who answered the survey. The survey went out to the Bar Association, the Prosecutor's Office and Public Defender's Office. Um, I, I think it's really important as part of the sure. presentation that I didn't like we didn't go back to look what office they worked oh, in. Oh, yeah. Which yeah, is someone who responded to the survey who might be in any one of those three. Mm -hmm. While I appreciate people being very honest to me personally, that is extremely concerning that somebody in our facility right now think of people and think of us as butt of all jokes because mm -hmm. not everybody that's there yeah, I got all comments and I have, so we'll just wait. But yeah. that is very disturbing. To yeah, me. it might not be someone in the system though. Right. The Bar Association is just attorneys. So, but I understand yeah. concern, that's concerning. But we specifically did not look at individual, you know, in Google, you can look at individual sort of responses. And we were a little concerned people would be, think we're trying to, pin, you know, pinpoint who's who. So, yes. That was typed in. So it was important that keeping with our transparency mm -hmm. that we provided all the answers. And, you know, I think as we're having some really difficult conversations, I think it's important for everyone to be honest and to be transparent. So um, that's what we've tried to encourage them to do. Yes. So in the, the PDF that you sent out, mm -hmm. um, it looks like the greatest percentage that people shared was about 16.7%. And, th and that was for two values. And I just want to make sure that I'm reading that correctly. And it's hard to see which uh, range that was associated with. It looks like 250 to 300 and three to 350. I think 400 to 450. So the reason this looks different than the one I sent you yesterday is because when I PDF'd it, it clipped part of the part of this legend and keeping with that transparency, I wanted to make sure you had all of it. So that's why it ended up being, I'm happy to follow up to figure out what the percentages are, uh, if you'd like and can provide those. Google's was hard to read. It was just really small. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I, I guess uh, my, my the reason I'm asking is I just want to clarify that the greatest percentage was 16.7. Like that was the most... Uh, oh, I have the, the highest concentration of votes for a range. I mean, the, we'd have to double check the numbers, but I mean, the only conclusion I feel that April and I can draw from this is there is definitely no consensus. I mean, it's yeah. just very divided and there's quite the range of, even if you try to, I was looking at it and trying to think like, okay, well, maybe if you combine 300 to 400, does that get you to a majority? And it doesn't from, from what I can tell. So it is... It is a wide spectrum okay. and the answers, but and we, we'll definitely follow up with the per specific percents as well. Yeah. This one was the weirdest of all of our charts just because there were so many responses. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else have any other questions mm -hmm. before we move on? Okay. In this question, um, a new Monroe County jail should include, and similar to some of the other graphs that we have seen, um, we have strongly agree, disagree, agree, and strongly agree. Strongly agree is or is um, green. Sorry, is green. As you can see, for most of these items, it was a pretty strong green. And that's substance use, mental health programming space, community programming spaces, outdoor recreation areas, family visiting spaces, visitation spaces, private medical interview areas, pretrial release, interview rooms for law enforcement, multiple intake desks, um, padded cells, intake and housing. And I think that's um, the last two are the kind of the lower greens. And then showers and individual cells, I think that was a predominant no opinion, um, second to strongly agree, and then agree. Hey, does anyone have any questions? Okay. And then um, once we did not plan on reading these questions. Uh, comments tonight, just once again, because of time limitations. Mm -hmm. uh, the slide presentation is, I think, 110 slides, so I know we have, but we're happy to read more if we have additional time at the end. 
And now we're on to Justice Campus design features. So um, in this question, we're getting at how important is the following features for a new Justice Campus? So we have two questions here, one about Justice Campus, and the next one is gonna be about courtrooms. So in terms of a Justice Campus, once again, uh, our green is our essential. Our yellow is very important. Um, I note that in almost all of these, they were predominantly essential. Uh, for the top, private rooms for in-person meetings, private rooms for Zoom or video conferencing, bus access, walking access, 24-hour security desk, and room for bailiffs or ASI. The other two, legal help kiosk, was actually predominantly very important with second essential, and the video display of court schedule was pretty close between our very important and essential and somewhat important right after. So I think this... Um, was a helpful representation of where people perceived these areas. Then we wanted to get into courtroom spaces. Um, similarly to the last one, um, our predominant greens were courtroom cameras, motion detecting, TV monitor, display videos to court or jury, equipment to play audio to court or jury, um, microphones for attorneys, emergency button for all staff. In fact, I think that had the strongest response of any of the others. Um, and then uh, for document cameras, projectors, monitors for jury and monitors for council table, you can see that their numbers are a little bit closer in terms of whether or not people um, thought they were between somewhat important, very important and essential. Um, in this section, we're also happy to answer any questions of what current services are provided in our current justice system if you have any questions. I don't know if you've had a chance to be in the, one of the courtrooms yet. Okay. Um, for those of you who um, haven't, just to let you know, uh, we don't currently have monitors for the jury. Um, we do not have, at least in the criminal courts, monitors for counsel table. Projector is provided by our office or each for our own cases, we provide our own projector at least in the criminal courts. Uh, document cameras is something new that we do have, I've seen in uh, criminal courtrooms. Um, courtroom cameras, from we do have one. We don't uh, use it quite often, but I know we have one. Uh, TV monitor display video or court to the jury. Um, just to let you know of current technological capacities, we have a TV that is wheeled in on a cart and that is placed within the courtroom to try to make sure everyone can see it. That obviously has some challenges. Um, since it has a cord and frequently have to provide your computer to attach to it to play something. So just to give you a sense of current technological capacities, equipment to play audio to court or jury. Um, I know our office has a boom box that we sometimes use, and I've also used um, my laptop with a CD drive to play, say like a 911 call to a jury. Um, so just to give you an idea of um, what we have. And we do not have microphones for attorneys. You can imagine some of us are soft-spoken. <laughs> and um, just to keep that in mind, when you're trying to keep a record of what is said in a courtroom, which may go up to a court of appeals or Supreme Court, um, just letting you know where we currently stand. An emergency button is only something the, a court has. And I know they'll talk probably more about that in their survey and what that capacity is. And we do not have a white noise machine. And this next section, we're down to comments. I'm trying to check our time. Um, okay, so it's 5.30. Uh, if we do have some extra time, I'm happy to read final thoughts. It's actually eight responses. Um, we can read, or it's 11 responses. We can bring, we can read those. Uh, I'm not sure since it's only 5.30, what the agenda, if we have enough time to read a little more comments. We do have a bit more on our agenda. Um, can you get all of this to Courtney and it could go on our website so that the comments would be available to everyone? Absolutely. Um, I think that might be the best way to do it at this point. And thank, thank you. you very much. This is very comprehensive, a lot of work, and uh, we really appreciate what you've put into it. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. I appreciate it. I, I feel like we need to thank everyone who actually responded. Um, we were impressed by the breadth of responses and especially the amount of people who are willing to sit and type 
pretty decent comment, pretty lengthy comment. Yeah. <laughs> it's very helpful. And honestly, um, surprised me a little bit. I thought we'd get a lot of answers to the sort of choose your own choice, but I didn't think we'd get as many types. So I'm pleasantly surprised. Yes. Yes. Um, when you do send this in, if you could send in the PDF instead of, or I'm sorry, the PowerPoint instead of the PDF, the PDF tended to cut off um, some of the um, graphs, especially when you had about eight graphs, it cut it off at like four. So um, the the PowerPoint seems to be the the best way forward. And I will also, I think, mention some of the data you shared today is helpful today, but a lot of the comments are going to be helpful months or, or hopefully not, you know, or even years down the road. The the comments, I would encourage everyone to read. They are yes. really helpful. Yeah, I certainly the comments are very important. And but as Peter said, they aren't all going to be important right at this time. And as a matter of fact, a lot of the questions aren't going to be important right at this time, but will be eventually. So, so okay, well, thank you very, very much. And before we move on to the next, can I just inquire to make sure are is the justice, the judicial branch going to be on the agenda for our next meeting? If for, you're ready for it, we yeah. will be. Yes, we can do that. All right. We'll plan on making our presentation at the first January meeting then. And thank you. Okay. Um, and our next, let's see. Jail design and construction and Mr. Cockerell was here, but I think probably something came up. There's really not a whole lot that's significant that's happening with that right now. It's just making it slow way forward. <laughs> um, I do have a question about it, it whenever is a good time. Um, I did notice that the environmental or some of the environmental reports were included in the packet that's set for this Wednesday. And I noticed that there was some information about sinkholes on the on the property. Um, and one looked like it was at the northern portion of it. It's the best way to describe it. I was wondering how that's uh, impacting our buildable area on that land. Um, I don't have the exact figures with me, but certainly Mr. Cockerell believes, and I don't see any reason not to think he's right, that while there will be some limitations, um, there will be plenty of buildable space available. And in some cases, the space that isn't really buildable can be used for parking lots. And also a lot of the area can be used for drainage to correct drainage problems that already exist there because of I-69. Um, so hopefully in using this space, we can fix those drainage problems. Anything else? Sorry, just one last more. You, you mentioned last meeting that there might be an extension. You might be seeking an extension of the contract. Is, is that happened yet? And do we know what that deadline is? Uh, the last we discussed it, it was still being sought. Um, I had thought maybe Mr. Cockrell would fill us in on that, but um, I'll certainly be hearing about that on Wednesday. So, um, And then the request for qualifications update um, is still kind of not going anywhere quite yet, but we are hoping to sometime in January, invite each of the three um, companies that we asked to submit RFQs, and inviting them here to hopefully kind of bring some demonstration stuff and talk to us about it and um, give us more information about what they can and can't do. And um, as for the update on the IU Center for Collaborative Systems change proposal, the commissioners did um, sign that agreement last Wednesday. And uh, today we had a kind of failed meeting with Linda Bra Brady, um, who Allison was very anxious to talk to the sheriff and to the probation department director. 
um, because there are people he, that she will really need to have a lot of collaboration with. But of course, the sheriff isn't sheriff until the 1st of January. Um, and we are uh, meeting with Linda Brady on Thursdays, so I can fill you in on that more at that time. And then the conversation with Jay Chowdhury. Would you like to talk about that, Peter? Sure, I can uh, fill people in. Um, you have uh, notes from this conversation uh, here before you. Uh, and we had a conversation uh, with Jay on the 8th, which was last Friday. Jay is the Director of Mental Health and Addictions uh, at Indiana FSSA. Uh, he was also chair of the Indiana Mental Health Commission, which just wrote its seminal report in 2022. We've talked about that at this meeting before. Um, and uh, in summary, uh, Jay recommended that uh, we import a contractor to help us with treatment. This conversation is about treatment, essentially, um, and uh, recommended that because Indiana is just so far behind that we look to other states with proven models. Uh, again, this is why I think it's been important that we've been on jail tours as well uh, to look at other models of incarceration. But this is about treatment. Uh, he recommended a place in Maricopa County, Arizona, Nashville, Tennessee, and Michigan. And Jay is going to be making introductions to those places to Commissioner Jones. I apologize for the just writing Lee there, but uh, those That's introductions okay. will be made to Commissioner Jones. Here, the second recommendation... Um, is uh, that we create a request for proposals. Uh, looks like I was dyslexic there, excuse me. That should be RFP uh, for three options. Uh, uh, to and, and he suggested that the commissioners and the council, if we wanted to take action on items quickly, that we just need to get it to a vote. He, what, uh, what Mr. Chadhari said is that he's been in multiple communities where they've talked about criminal justice and community justice for years and years and years on end and nothing ever got done and so he suggested that when you know we're ready to get to that point that we outline three options and that the commissioners uh vote on it and then have the council appropriate the dollars um and because he he said you know just you could talk about this for eternity um so uh recommend we are and just to be clear, the RFP has not been issued. Uh, we're not looking uh, at that. And then the last recommendation was to focus on diversion. Um, we specifically asked about regional treatment centers. Um, it doesn't look like that's going to happen this legislative cycle. And that uh, FSSA seems to be focusing more on 988 crisis response teams and other diversion measures. And that seems to be what's coming coming, coming down out of the, the legislative pike. So um, that's what he he encouraged us to focus on. Any questions about this conversation? I do have um, at least one to begin with. Uh, when you say treatment, treatment in what capacity? You referenced it in recommendation one. Are we talking out of jail, diversion, in jail? So Maricopa County has a focus has has a focus on a um, crisis diversion center. Think like our Stride Center, but it's not but it's it's community wide there's multiple sites um and it's it's not based on incarceration so it's not inside of a jail um uh, it's not housed within the sheriff's department uh it's a community resource that's run by other communities um connections health solutions uh, you can google that that's that sub bullet point is a private company that was born out of um this model um and what they do is they offer their services to communities to help build up that type of of situation in fact jay uh mentioned that he had seen our stride center and he said that's somewhat similar to what the stride center is except think of it more as a a, a bigger more robust crisis center the center in nashville tennessee is somewhat the opposite it's based in a jail so it is it does have an incarceration focus to it and jay had said you know if you if you want to go down that road you know contact them but he said my sense after talking with with us was was he was like i it seems like the maricopa version is is more appropriate for you guys it, it seems to be more of, of what you guys are, are, are looking at y'all are looking at excuse me and is this in addition to building a jail? Like, for example, number one is we want to build more stride centers or things comparable to those types of facilities in addition to just thinking back to that Ray report and it's saying we can't maintain constitutional standards of care in that jail. So I just 
people are still in it at this moment. So I was wondering if these are programs for treatment in addition to the need for a jail. I, at this point, I don't think we have enough information to make that determination. This was an initial conversation where he was throwing out ideas and we wanted to be as transparent as possible and present to you what we talked about. Okay, so building a jail is still something the commissioners and the county council are considering. Building a jail is something the county council and the commissioners are still considering? Yes, it is. Okay. But it's not clear that it may be a kind of double facility. Um, so there, there are just a whole lot of options open to us. I think that um, you know, there's always a lot of resistance to change. And, you know, change begets change and can cause some difficulties, but without change, we remain in the same situation. Um, so, you know, I think that we're going to have to come up with a, with a plan that will account for a variety of things. And what we want to do more than anything else is provide a continuum of possibilities for the judges for sentencing and also have a continuum within the community for mental health treatment. And so, you know, hopefully we'll be working towards both of those, whether or not that will turn out to be practical, we have yet to know. Um, we're still looking for a lot of information about a lot of things. All right, is any other questions? Oh, could we get a copy of those RFQs yes. that they're gonna come present to us in January? Uh, yeah, they should be in the Dropbox. Is that I not? I don't know if I have access have... to the Dropbox. Okay. Um, let me talk to TSD about this and figure out what the best way is. So you, you all don't have Dropboxes either. Uh, no. no one does. Okay. Is that something that, because I feel like Judge Stafford had made a comment about this last week, where we could, as a committee, have a drop box where those things could be located and we can all go to those things when we can. Okay. Yeah, that's that's what would be ideal. And I don't really see any reason why there would be okay. a problem with that. But I mean, we've set up many, many drop boxes for individual groups. So I suspect that won't be a problem, but I'll okay. check with TSD about okay. it. I don't know if there's something judicial <laughs> that would we affect access, that. We can access a Dropbox. That's, okay. that's fine. We we can't um, communicate with people about particular cases, but sure. uh, you know we can look at RFQs in a Dropbox. I don't I don't anticipate that being a problem. Okay, great. And I just wanted to mention that that I don't think council has seen the RFQ documents either. So um, I don't yeah, if if that's possible to just share it out just, with everybody. I'll actually. Um, I, I think maybe the reason they were originally supposed to go in a Dropbox is because they were too big to be sent by email. Um, I'll check with Mr. Cockrell, and, and if he can send them by email, I'll ask him to, but otherwise we'll get a Dropbox set up and let you know where, where and how and to access it. Anything else? Um, then if there's nothing else, we can have public comment, which will be limited to, yes, Catherine. I'm so sorry. I just want to confirm our January meetings before we go to public comment in case anyone has to leave, um, from the audience before then. I know we'll all be staying. We can just confirm those dates. Is that the second and the 16th and is the second a county holiday? So are we going to go with the 9th and the 16th? The 16th um, is Martin Luther King Day. Yeah, this is something that when I was thinking about how we handled Hanukkah, I realized that it actually was not our original intention in that our plan had been if we can't meet because of a vacation or something, it would go to the next day. That could be problematic as far as a place to meet. So... Um, 
Could we do the 9th and the 23rd? That probably would be the best plan, given what the calendar is for January. And you guys are presenting on the 9th. Is that what I... That would be my understanding. Mm -hmm. And that meeting is on the county calendar, uh, but the meeting is not yet on the county calendar for the 23rd. So we'll we'll get that up there. Okay. Is there anyone who has a problem with January 9 or January 23rd? Okay. Thank you. I appreciate being able to confirm that. Probably planning. Yeah. Can I just want to yeah. ask one question before I get to public comment? And we kind of talked about it last week, but... Um, when you're talking about this Maricopa County site, is that a, that's separate from the jail, correct, Peter? Yeah, yeah, okay. that that would be yeah, that's separate from a jail. Okay. Potentially, I you know, so I don't know. I have not yeah. been down there, but in okay. in what he was talking to us, he he said that it's separate from incarceration. I mean, incarceration model. Because I, I believe yeah. the report, and I sort of referenced this last week, said that you shouldn't have the treatment in the jail better right. to have community-based treatment. So we had right. talked about that last week. So we're still talking about building, because I thought you just mentioned having a facility. We're still hoping to. I mean, the, there's to a great a, deal. A facility for mental health. And well, we haven't yet determined exactly how we can do this. We're going to have to have a contractor and hear what possibilities there are. Um, this is something that we hope to work out. There are going to be other problems to be worked out with it, um, in particular with the treatment part, uh, staffing it could be a pretty serious problem. Um, so there, there are going to be many, many problems that we'll be looking at and hopefully solving. Um, well, yes, yeah, I would just encourage the community base because that's also access. Easier. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, that would definitely be best. But the Maricopa County Jail itself is also uh, kind of a leader in what in jails that don't necessarily provide treatment in the jail. Well, actually, they do have a kind of mental health wing where they do have some treatment. Um, but just the whole setup of the jail is is kind of a new concept, and it, it would be very interesting to look into it more closely. Does that help? Thank you very much. So that's something separate from the jail. It's community based treatment. Right. So the Fullerton Pike, you're still looking to build a jail on. Yes. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Uh huh. I have to jut out. I'm sorry. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Erica. Um, I don't want to take away from public comment because uh, I'm um, after our finding and all of the survey results. I would definitely love to hear what the public um, has to say about this. Um, I think it's important for some of us to or the committee to weigh in on what we heard and I appreciate y'all doing that um, and everybody else that made or that participated in the survey. So 67 results of people saying various things. Uh, it was a lot. Um, and I have sat here in silence for a little bit and have lots of notes on my computer here and here. Um, and I don't know if I feel fully comfortable in continuing with me personally. I don't know if I feel comfortable in going with the Fullerton Pike property. Um, and here's why. We have experts that are here and we have experts that have weighed in and we being the financial body and in the, the county, um, it almost feels like we are telling people that are experts how to do their job in a way that seems to be that it's going to make it harder. Uh, I counted, let's see, 5, 10, 15, 20, over 20 responses out of, the, I think, the 30 that y'all were reading of people that had said, bad idea, this is harmful, this is lots of things 
how are we going to like winter is coming, you know, things like that. The one person that made seven responses that stuck out a lot to me. And that's what I wrote down in my notes. Um, yeah, I don't feel comfortable. I know it's late in the game uh, to say that, considering that it's going to first reading for the city council on Wednesday. I don't feel comfortable. I just feel like I need to say that because as a committee member and also a financial member responsible for things, I've said this since the very beginning of me being on this committee that I feel like we are really rushing into something that this is a really challenging moment for us right now where we can we can set ourselves up to succeed or set ourselves up to fail and the findings and i'm sure and i'm so curious to hear what the judges surveys will say next month um although my hunch is that it probably won't be far off from what we have heard this evening really gives me great pause and i ask us to take a pause for a minute to figure out what the heck it is that we're about to do um, I no longer feel comfortable with the Fullerton Pike property. Uh, I don't know if everybody got the community response from the one individual that, okay, so, uh, and I, I saw that last night, um, and then I saw it this morning and was finally feeling well enough to respond to it today, and I did. Um, but in the Ray report, and I'm looking at it right now, which is why I'm staring at my computer screen, and it talks about how we should be making a comparative study of cost, renovating costs. Um, if that's in the report that we took the time to do and have somebody do and the county paid for it to do, I think we need to push ourselves to look at, for sake of transparency, um, and what community members have been asking for, I think it would be necessary for us to have that just as a comparative way for us to see what it is that we're doing. Um, I'll stop talking here in a little bit because uh, I, again, want to hear a public comment, but I just, I just feel like we are pushing something that just does not feel right. Um, and I ask ourselves to really think about what it is that we're about to do, what we're trying to do, and to slow down while making sure that we are taking care of those that are incarcerated while they are there, but truly think about how lives will be changed, how employees' lives will be changed, how the trajectory of this location could change for 40 plus more years um, to go. So I just felt like I needed to say that um, as well. But I'd, I, I would personally ask for us to have a comparative cost of renovating and for us to really, after these surveys are done, to really take our time to think about what it is that we're about to do. Because I think this almost feels like a train wreck that we can't stop watching, that we're watching. Well, I would like to just very, and this isn't really even a response to what you said, and I'll certainly talk to the commissioners about that possibility. <laughs> and the feeling up to now has been that we know that building, and I'm not talking about the jail in particular, I'm talking about the entire building has big problems. And we it's going to be difficult to deal with those um and then of course doing this evaluation is going to cost quite a bit when we have had an evaluation done admittedly not at that level um but certainly we can look into doing that at the same time i want to say that when we ask questions like these it's very easy for people to talk about what's wrong and what they don't like. But what I noticed was that people talked about all kinds of things that are wrong with our jail now. But 
no one has really talked about how to make it right. And well, I, I didn't hear anything that really addressed it very well. But I, I think these are things we still have to learn about, look into, but it would be helpful if we could kind of balance the negative with positive, you know, at least attempt to look and see if there are solutions for things aside from the way it's always been done. Um, but that may be difficult and it may turn out that we can't really do that. Um, but I, well, Can I we, ask a question based on that then? All right. Uh, you want to talk about positives, but is there a reason, and I don't think it's really been talked about, like why we couldn't renovate the current jail space in the current building? Because we know the condition of the overall building is in trouble. And what does that mean? Like, is it going to collapse? The H, I need to know. We have, well, actually, I would have to talk to David Gardner about this because he's the person who knows very clearly what the problems are. And he certainly does not believe that there's any good way to go about that. Um, and I will point out that the fact that the jail is on multiple floors is taking much, much more staff than would be needed with a jail that's all on one floor. The long waits for inmates to be moved around have to do with that. Um, a lot of the, the things that people would like to see change it's going to be very difficult to change in that jail. It's going to be hard to have five to six meeting rooms there. Um, you know, they, there's just a lot to be thought about. So while it's easy to say Fullerton Pike is a, not an ideal location, and I understand it's not, um, our alternative may be doing nothing. And that would not serve us well at all because then what probably happens is the federal government does come in and tells us that we must build a jail and tells us what it's to look like, what how it's to function, how big it's supposed to be, and good chance it'll end up on Fullerton Pike. Um, so, you know, unless we can figure out some really good ways of solving the problems in our current jail, it's going to be difficult to stay there. But to the point where it might, if we were to build a new jail, it'll take several years. Yes. Has the county talked to a contractor to see if there can be improvements, at least in the short term? Because we have people in our jail every day who are living in these conditions yes. that were outlined in the report, which are not ideal. Yes. Um, yeah, I, we, ideally, we could do something for them immediately. I think that people are asking that, first of all, there be an evaluation, which would probably take some time. And then there's implementation, which would also take more time. And then, of course, that's money that's been spent that can't be used for other things like treatment and programming and things like that. So, I mean, it's, it's a huge complex problem. And, and I, I appreciate that. Um, and I appreciate that we're having this conversation just to go back. It's, I don't think it's an either or though. I think when we talk about, I think we're talking about two different issues that might be, um, might feel more intertwined than they are. I think the comment was, should it be Fullerton Pike? Um, is different than could it be a different low? Is there renovations that could happen in the jail? For example, I think we talked about the Thompson property, which has already been zoned MI conditional use for a jail, which is in the city limits, which has better access, both walking access and car access. 
And so I, I think that's a different issue of where we could put the jail versus design. And going to Judge Crothy's point, we have members of our community that are in that jail right now, and we all go back to work tomorrow, and they're there. And if we can make improvements, I understand that may cost money, but the report says that that jail cannot maintain constitutional standards of care. And going back to our guidelines, I think we should strive every minute Absolutely. starting a year ago when that report came out to treat people with dignity, including the inmates who are there right now. Yes, well, um, that report and the fact that we cannot provide constitutional care and the fact that we know that that building is very difficult, all of these things together, plus a number of other things have led us in this direction. Um, but we're interested in input. I can tell you that we see a lot of problems with the Thompson site. Um, and oh, Kate Wiltz has something she wants to say. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just wanted to um, either ask or remind that I, I, I remember that at least the commissioner's budget had a, a significant amount of money for um, projects at the current jail building for 2023. Am I, and maybe it's not the commissioner's budget, maybe it was the bond, but, and I, I'm sorry, I'm not at my county computer to look things up right now, but um, and I just want, I don't want everyone to have the impression that we're not maintaining and putting money into the current building to keep it safe because we've discussed it. And unfortunately, I don't have it in front of me, but I'm pretty sure we've we have a significant amount of money going toward that exact thing. Yes, we do. And, and we're actually planning on, we do have plans for some things with the current jail. We're going to be replacing all the locks at a huge expense that I don't remember exactly what it is. Um, any problems that come up, we'll certainly try our best to solve. I think what we aren't going to be able to do is come up with extra rooms for programming, for meetings with inmates, for any of that stuff um, at this time we cannot accomplish at that jail. So in the end, you know, we're going to have to make some rather difficult decisions about all of this. Sure. I don't think there's any way that everyone is going to end up being happy. Um, as I said, we're talking about change and change is something people don't like. So, and I, I'm sorry, it's after six now and we have not had any public comment. How many people want to comment? Oh, if it's only one person, then let's go ahead. I would agree. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I have something. Yeah, yeah, I would remind everyone that you can comment online. And if wanted to go to the panel, I don't think you need Um, Courtney, did you do a sign up sheet? Okay. If, okay, yeah. Make sure we know your name and. Ready? <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. Thank and you. there will be a three minute time limit. Perfect. Okay. Um, hello, my name is Sydney Foreman, and I'm with the Care Not Cages. We're a group made up of local residents who understand how damaging jail is and how important it is to make sure the fewest possible members of our community have to spend time there. Um, and I would just really like to echo um, Ms. Crossley's comments this evening, and I think she brought up some really important points about feeling uncomfortable. And I think after reading all of those comments from people who spend their time there and work there and live this life every day, um, if they see that many problems with it, you should all be very uncomfortable. Um, and I think that speaks 
volumes to that this location is not a good idea. It's not a good idea. Um, I think um, coming back to my written comments were here. Um, Karen Ott Cages is here to ask first why the county and the CJRC in particular have not followed up with the most obvious and promising recommendation of the K Ken Ray report to estimate the cost of renovating the existing facility. Why has this step not been taken? And if a renovation isn't enough, um, why not a, an adaptive reuse? Why aren't we looking at stripping the building back down a little bit more, reconfiguring the walls, providing more space, readjusting some things? Um, and one of the comments that wasn't read out loud, but I noticed said that there are spaces in the current jail that aren't being used, some rooms that aren't being used. Um, and why? Why is that? Why can't we use what we have or think about what we have already? That's all. Thanks. Thank you. Does Oh, uh, we have someone online. I'm sorry, I can't. Okay. Yes, can. Can THD scroll up on the webinar chat so I can read that? I think. Thank you so much. Uh, Becca Schwartz uh, uh, wrote, oh my goodness, there's a lot. Uh, Hello, my name is Becca Schwartz and I'm a law student at Mauer as well as a resident in Ellettsville. We saw that many of the attorneys were concerned about splitting the jail from court services, et cetera. At the same time, you all mentioned that it's important to address current issues at the jail because it will still be open for a while. My question is, why isn't it being more seriously considered to renovate the current jail in order to completely avoid the separation of the jail from downtown services? If we can see all the barriers that people will face, not just for people who work in the system, but people who are caged in the system, and we see how the current jail needs work regardless of a new jail being built, why are we not more seriously considering renovation? How much would renovation cost? Wouldn't that, be better? Wouldn't that better serve the people of Monroe County? Also, a second question, why are we looking to spend this money on treatment in jails instead of a rehabilitation center that would keep the jail population down and actually serve the people that you are charged to serve? Why don't we put most of the funding towards things like the Stride Center, et cetera? TH, uh, TSD, is there more or is that the end of the comment? And thank you. Jennifer, it's hard to change trajectories, but it's so wonderful to hear someone serving our community actually listen to our community. Oh. <laughs> All right. Is there any other public comment? And seeing none, we are adjourned. <laughs>